if we crucify the old man of sin with all of his concupiscences, which St. Paul says, after having been conformed to Christ crucified, we will become similar to our Lord glorified. So that is what we call, you might say, the economy of salvation. We do this here, we obtain that there. All right. Um, St. Leo the Great said, O wondrous power of the cross, O ineffable glory of the passion, on the cross we behold the tribunal of the Lord, the judgment of the world, and the power of Jesus crucified. Yes, Lord, you attract all things to yourself at the very moment at which you extend your hands to an incredulous people who, and who offend you gravely. The entire world turns toward the cr thy cross in order to bless you. You attract all things to thyself precisely that at that moment of loathing the crime of the Jews and where the elements rose up in horror, the sun being darkened, the earth trembling and the rocks breaking and death giving up its victims. Thou dost attract all things to thyself. The veil of the temple rips in two. The Holy of Holies escapes from the unworthy priests, in order that the figure become reality, the prophecies be fulfilled, and that the former faith cede to the gospel. You attract all things to thyself, that which was veiled by the hidden mysteries in the only temple of the Jews will now be seen by the entire world. It will perceive the truth in the light. And that's from his sermon on the Passion, number eight, his eighth sermon on the Passion, if you want to read that. So the cross is the celestial chariot which the victorious Jesus Christ uses to triumph over sin, the world, and death. St. Paul said, and despoiling the principalities and powers, he hath exposed them confidently in open show, triumphing over them in himself. That's Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, and also uh, 14. Blotting out the handwriting of the decree that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he hath taken the, the same out of the way, fastening it to the cross. St. Cyprian said, the stone is the, excuse me, the cross is the stone which David used to strike the forehead of Goliath and kill him. St. Gregory the Great said, the cross is the universitatis vinculum, the, 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 the uh, bond of the universe. What breaks the whole universe, uh, what, excuse me, what binds the whole universe together. And also, St. Paul in Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, verse 20 says, And through him to reconcile all things unto himself, making peace through the blood of his cross, both as to the things that are on earth and the things that are in heaven. See, so that the idea of binding everything together in himself by the cross. And in the same chapter, Colossians verse 24, chapter 1, verse 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up those things which are wanting of the sufferings of Christ in my flesh for his body, which is the church. This is a very famous quote because it's somewhat mysterious. It, we're, making, we're, we're filling up those things that are wanting of the sufferings of Christ. It sounds as though Christ didn't suffer enough. And so it, it, we're going to explain that. In my flesh, for his body, which is the church. So I'm going to explain that now. The passion of Christ is complete and perfect in itself, obviously. Being of infinite merit, and is more than sufficient to redeem us. Nonetheless, 
there is lacking something to it which must come from us. We are referring to the participation which we must have in the sufferings and merits of Jesus Christ, that is, our cooperation. Not only did our Lord have to suffer himself, but he must also suffer in his members. And by this commonness of suffering, his body, that is the church, grows and is perfected. So the crucifixion of Christ must go through all the ages, so to speak, in his church, by the crucifixion of the members. And I'll explain that too. By accepting the pains and sufferings of life, the faithful participate in the merits of the passion. So we offer up our daily cross, and in so doing, we are crucified with Christ. Remember what Christ said. He gave three things that we must do. First is deny ourself. Deny yourself. Two is take up thy cross. And follow me. So this denial of yourself is the, a, a type of self-annihilation, which is an act of humility. In other words, it's to say that of myself I am nothing. Right? This is to take up your cross in reparation for sin. And those are the two aspects of the, the Mass. That is, a, it is a, a sacrifice of propitiation, excuse me, a sacrifice of praise, adoration, and that's where this is accomplished, that is, see the reason for the destruction of the victim in the Old Testament, and really all sacrifices, even pagan sacrifices, is a, one of the things, is a symbol that of ourselves, we are nothing, we are dead, so to speak. God is everything. You know, God is a source of life, he's a source of existence. It's a, a, a way of stating that. So the victim is killed. See, so the, the, this denying oneself is part of that. It is to say this is the destruction of the victim. Now our Lord was the perfect sacrifice and he was the victim who was destroyed by his death on the cross, you see. So that, that is the, an act of adoration to God, that God is the supreme creator, the supreme ruler of the universe, and see that, that, that denying of oneself is con contained in that. It is also the antidote to Adam's pride. Adam's pride is to assert oneself. See, it is humanity asserting itself against the creator. So to deny oneself is the, the opposite. See, so that's one aspect. The other is atonement for sin. And that's where the suffering comes in. The daily suffering, the daily crucifixion. Take up thy cross. Daily, he said, I'm sorry, yes, daily. And that the, this, this sacrifice of Christ is also propitiation for sin, and the Mass is a propitiatory sacrifice, both of praise and propitiatory. So you see the spirituality of the Mass in all of this. You come to the Mass to offer this daily sacrifice in union with the priest at the altar, who is in union with the invisible head of the church, who is the principal priest. So you see the ecclesiology of the Mass that way. And you see also why unicum is wrong, because you destroy that ecclesiology by putting somebody in there, offering the Mass, the vicar of Christ, the, the visible head of the Christ, or so, so, you know, so it claims, 
who is out, who can't be what he says he is because he has promulgated heresy. So that name in there is not merely a, a little detail of the mass. It is the whole ecclesiology of the mass, because it is the the ecclesiology of the spirituality of the the mass and the sacrifice of the cross. It is absolutely central to Catholicism. And that's one of the reasons, too, why, why you have a collection at Mass. That's not merely to keep the lights on. That is your, your, a, a symbol of your denial of yourself, this, this self-annihilation. Uh, you're giving something of yourself to the sacrifice, and that's your way of participating in it through the action of the priest. It's very important. See, in the new Mass, you're giving bread to God. So we give you bread, and you give us back yourself. And it's like Christmas. It's an exchange of gifts. We're, yes, we're giving bread to God, but as a symbol of ourselves that, it, uh, that you know, it's, it's our little way of participating in the sacrifice, which is the sacrifice of the cross, not the sacrifice of bread. See, That's very important to understand. It's a little way, just as the collection is a little way in which to participate, to show your participation in the sacrifice. But the sacrifice is the sacrifice of the body and blood of Christ. It is not the sacrifice of the bread and the wine. The, they are merely presented as symbols of our participation. And if you look at the prayers of the Mass, you'll see that. See, so that, that's a big, big difference between the new Mass and the traditional Mass. That's why in the early church they would bring up all sorts of things in kind. That means... Uh, in um, uh, you know food and candles and, and other things which would be for the use of the priests uh, uh, and th that's why the offertory verse was very long at that time because all these people would be coming up with various things and uh, uh, as, as symbols of their, their, their participation in this great sacrifice in other words their participation in Christ the victim as members of the church as a symbol, but they must carry their crosses every day. They must offer themselves in sacrifice every day. That's the spirituality of the Mass. So, uh, so that it's, it's a very important point that the church must also be crucified. His body, his mystical body must also cr be crucified. So this is what uh, so they, they um, so by accepting the pains and sufferings of life, the faith will participate in the merits of the passion. So at least that, accepting the pains and the sufferings of life, what comes to you. Saints understand this so much that they look for the cross. They inflict their own pains upon themselves, their own mortifications. They are, that's what makes the saint the saint, really. He understands this this principle down, down to its very depths. So they're not content with just what God sends them. <laughs> they, they look for it. They impose things on themselves. They impose mortifications. That, that's really the religious life. In all forms of religious life. It's to impose suffering and mortification on yourself because, uh, of, because it increases the, that union with Christ the victim. So saint, that's why saints, you know, they do things that we don't, we think, I could never do that. But they understand that principle so deeply that they're moved to do it, of course, by the grace of God. So this is what St. Paul says when, uh, means when he says, I accomplish in my flesh what is lacking to the passion of Jesus Christ by suffering for his body, which is the church. So in their acceptance of the cross, the faith will become participants in the divine nature. They become also participants in the glory of Jesus Christ in eternity. St. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, Si tamen compatimur ut et conglorificemur. And if we suffer with him, we will be glorified with him. I think that's one of the short lessons of this time. 
<clears throat> St. Ambrose and St. John Chrysostom say this, since the church is the body of Christ mystically animated by a single soul having the same life as Jesus Christ, it must endure the same and only passion as his and with him. In man's body, pain is common to the head as to the, as to the members. In other words, if you're suffering someplace in your hand or your foot, it it affects your head in the sense that you are aware of it, you, you are pained by it. See, it's, it's not just confined to one member. It is St. Paul who makes this admirable comparison, and this is both of these saints, it's a, it's a summary of both of those saints. When one member suffers, all other members suffer with him. And if one member receives an honor, all others rejoice with him. You are the body of Jesus Christ and member one of another. That's in St. Paul and 1 Corinthians. Consequently, uh, did he not say to Saul, who persecuted his church, excuse me, consequently, he did not say to Saul, who was persecuting his church, why do you persecute, persecute my church? He did not say that to St. Paul when he threw him off the horse. But he said, why do you persecute me? Very, very important. Just as Jesus Christ communicates his grace and patience, so he communicates his suffering and suffers with those who suffer. And you say, well, why do we have to suffer? Because the whole earth labors under the shadow of sin. Original sin and actual sin. This is not a paradise. It is a place that is stained by sin. And the, we must atone for those sins. Our own sins and the sins of others. So that's why one of the greatest acts of charity is to atone for the sins of other people. And to ask for sufferings in order to atone for the sins of others. You see that in the saints. So when he says, St. Paul says, I accomplish that which remains to suffer in Jesus Christ, it means it is necessary that I announce the gospel and make known Jesus Christ to the Gentiles in order that the church grow, be perfected, and become fully a participant in the passion and redemption of the Savior. The Catholic must know that the life of a Christian consists in, of interior and exterior sufferings. Take up thy cross daily. Either sent by God or sought by himself voluntarily. So some sufferings are sent by God. Illness and all kinds of you know, mental illness, physical illness, uh, poverty. They are sent by God. Some are voluntarily sought and accepted, as in religious life, or the example of the great saints. So the Catholic must expect these every day and even desire them for the motive of conforming himself to Christ crucified. There is always something in us that wants to just lead a nice life there's always that idea that you know that we, we search comforts and, and there's nothing wrong with legitimate comforts. It's just that we should not get the idea in our heads that we are here only for a nice life. We are here to be crucified. To be sacrificed for these motives. To deny ourselves and to do atonement for sin. This is the purpose of human life. And that's why the Holy Cross, the crucifixion, is seen everywhere in Catholic institutions, in the, in the church. You can't, you, know, you can't be without it. It's everywhere. 
So, just let me finish this. So he must expect these crosses every day. Every day we are pierced with arrows, either from God, from the devil, from the world, from the flesh, from friends, from enemies, from evil tongues, from illnesses, from reverses and problems in our lives, and trials. And these last three, the illnesses and the reverses and the trials, come from God. And so we must expect them and embrace them. Just as our Lord embraced his cross, we must embrace these things for the motives that we see. So this is absolute foolishness to the world. This is total foolishness to the world and to the modernists, which is the same thing. But this is Catholic spirituality. It's foolishness to the Protestant who does not see any of this. As I always say, the, to the toll is paid, so just cross the bridge. You, you don't have to worry. There is no idea of being crucified with Christ in his mystical body. It's all paid for. So no matter how many sins you commit, it's okay. It's all paid for. That's the Protestant mentality. So... God sends us sufferings for five reasons. One is to overcome our disobedience and our pride and to submit us to himself. <clears throat> In this way, he knocked. St. Paul off his horse and converted him. So we, our disobedience and our pride has to be overcome. It's humiliating. To, to chastise our sins and have us expiate them. And in this way he punished the Jews in the Old Testament. Three, to destroy and especially weaken in us the concupiscence of the flesh. So he sends to, sends to the lustful the sufferings of illness, contradictions, disappointments, and remorse. And in this way, he puts pressure on them to combat and overcome these inclinations. So it's a mercy. For he sends us sufferings to bring man to patience, holiness, and perfection. It is in this way that God struck Job and Tobias. This is the way he perfects the just. So he corrects sinners and he perfects the just. Five, to make someone come nearer to Jesus Christ and to make him similar to Christ. Perfect example is the stigmata of St. Francis. See, the, the closer you come to Christ, the more you desire to be conformed to Christ, and therefore God sent St. Francis the five wounds to be conformed to him. And uh, it's, 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 as I said, the saints totally understand these val this value of suffering and how it pertains to our state in this world. 
And as I told you before, there is always a voice in us saying, this world is meant to be totally enjoyed. And the purpose of life here is to have a nice, enjoyable, good life that is always barking in us. And what we forget is that this world is overshadowed with the problem of sin. It is sin that required the, the passion and death of Christ. It has given us all of the, it has given us concupiscence. Cupis, S-C-N-C. It has given us pride, all of the capital sins. It has engaged the earth in our punishment. It's in, it's in, uh, it's in um, Genesis. That's why we have cold and heat and tornadoes and hurricanes and earthquakes. This is not a nice place. <laughs> we have to constantly work and struggle in order not to starve to death, in order not to freeze to death, in order to have something to eat, in order to have something over our heads. Because all of those things, all of those things that I mentioned, whether it's starvation or cold or heat or no water, they're all banging at our door. They would all overtake us. And that's because of sin. It's no longer a paradise. You see, the, so, uh, the, 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 our whole existence is predicated on sin. If you don't understand that, you'll never understand why Christ came and died on the cross. You will never understand the, the Catholic spirituality regarding mortification and detachment. You'll never understand it. This is not a pretty place. <laughs> we die. We get sick and die. We get old and sick and die. It's, you know, every, no matter how great a life you may lead, you get old, you get sick, and you die. Sometimes you die young. Wars come, and you die young. Think of all those young men that died on battlefields in the 20th century. That's this world. So you have to understand that that Therefore, the, that the suffering that God sends us is both correctional and it is, we might say, perfectional. I don't know if that's an English word. But it, it, uh, it, it, for the just, it draws you more into the image of Christ the Savior. Christ the crucified Savior. And therefore, you're more pleasing to God because you're more pleasing in this sacrifice that Christ made to his Father. In other words, you are identified with that sacrifice. God, the Father, was extremely pleased by the act of obedience of his Son on the cross. And the more you conform yourself to that, the more you become pleasing to God. You have to think about all of these things a great deal because of that barking dog that, you know, this is, you're supposed to have a nice life here. It says it on the, the cereal box. It says, we were born to have a full and enjoyable life. And it shows somebody riding a bike. And, and, ha and you can see it's, it's on the cereal box. I, I look at it and I, I think, well, it's a little different from what we understand. The... <laughs> And, you know, a young uh, father holding his kid on his shoulders, everybody's smiling and happy. And, and uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with riding bikes and being smiling and happy. But the, that's not the purpose of our life. 
You see, those things are fleeting. Yes, we have happy moments, we have comfortable moments, we, we naturally seek to be as comfortable as possible within reason. But the, the, it's not the purpose of our lives. The purpose of our lives is to bear our cross faithfully and to be, to be conformed to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ crucified. That's the purpose of our lives. Imagine that on the, ba ba on the uh, back of a cereal box. <laughs> I should get that. I'll bring that in, that box. <laughs> um, so you, you have to really contemplate that in your, in your meditation. This is something you have to, has to get into your soul why we, we do these things, and then that you understand the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, that the, that's the center of Catholic spirituality, the renewal of the sacrifice of the Mass, of the sacrifice of Calvary. It's everything. All of the actual graces that come into the world come through that Mass, and that's why it's so important to say that Mass. It's like a Niagara Falls of actual graces. because it constantly pleases God. It's our sacrifice to God. God is pleased, just as he was pleased in a way by the Old Testament sacrifices. They were fulfilling the law, the animals being killed and offered to God, burned, the Holocaust. He was pleased by that. God must be pleased, but he is supremely pleased by the sacrifice of Calvary, and that is why it is continued throughout time in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And that's our sacrifice, and we must participate in that sacrifice. All right, so that, that's, that's, you'll never understand any of what I'm saying here unless you figure that out. So God is resolved uh, to make known by the admirable patience of the saints the power of the cross. So that's why he sends the cross to saints to, sh to show forth the power of the cross. Christ himself, in coming into this world, chose no other good than the sufferings of Calvary. You might remember a sermon that I gave, how he was, his mind was constantly on this, his hour, his suffering. And he even made his mother think constantly of that and would not let her enjoy the fact in his presence or in the presence of others that she was the mother of God because she had to be conformed to him and she had to think about his hour just as much as he did. It was only after that she was assumed into heaven and crowned in heaven as mother of God. She was always mother of God from the time of the Annunciation. But she could not enjoy that just as he could not enjoy his own divinity, you might say. He was there as a victim of sacrifice. And so the saints have to portray that same, that same idea just as he drew his mother into it, he will draw the saints into it and holy people in general. So if you want to find God, then look for the cross. He is attached to it, and you will find him there. St. Louis de Montfort said, and I mentioned it in the sermon, that we should never think of Christ except crucified. In some way, attached to his passion, even the sacred heart, that's Christ in his passion. Those, the, the cross and, and Christ are so closely united. That's why we talk about the adoration of the cross. It is not that we are adoring a piece of wood, obviously. We are adoring it in, in the broad sense. We are giving it a, a supreme veneration because Christ is necessarily attached to that cross. That's why you know, there's, there's the... We, we, on Good Friday, there's, there's the exposition and veneration of the cross. 
And it's actually called the adoration. The reason it's called adoration is because you genuflect in front of it. Adoratio means bending the knee. It, but it's not doesn't mean the adoration you give to God. You're not adoring a piece of wood. Uh, but the um, the uh, the a special veneration is given to the cross because it's intimately connected with Christ, making practically a single thing with Christ, practically. So you should read Saint Louis de Montfort. It's in the uh, Love of the Eternal Wisdom, very short book and a beautiful book. He says, wisdom is the cross. That's the, that's the book in summary. And the cross is wisdom. Now you've read the book. <laughs> but he makes that, that point. So if you are crushed with suffering, rejoice because you have found Christ and you are with him. You're conformed to the to the sacrificing Christ, priest and victim. In Saint Matthew, our Lord said in the Eight Beatitudes, "Beati qui persecutionem patiuntur propter justitiam coniam ipsorum es regnum celorum." Blessed are they who suffer persecution for justice' sake, for theirs is the the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they. Happy. That means happy. Happy in a supernatural way. The Novus Ordo translates it as happy, which is just an awful translation. It, it's blessed. That Blessed is supernatural happiness. It's not having a party or something like that. But that the idea is an interior rejoicing. Psalm 90, verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> he shall cry to me, and I will hear him. I am with him in tribulation. I will deliver him, and I will glorify him. I will fill him with length of days, and I will show him my salvation. In Latin, Clamavit ad me ed ego exaudium eum. Com ipso sum in tribulatione, eripiam eum, e glorificabo eum, longitudine dierum replebo eum, et ostendam ili salutari meum. And you see, the passion of Christ gives value to all of our tribulations and sufferings. <clears throat> they would be valueless if he had not died on the cross and given us the ability to merit through the grace that he has given us. So it, it's just, it would, our tribulations and crosses would be like confederate money. No value, or money from a monopoly game. No value whatsoever. But they have value, meritorious value, by the fact that Christ died on the cross. Again, that's why you offer yourself up in the Mass all of these crosses that you bear, you offer up with the cross in the Mass. That's Catholic spirituality. Both as a sacrifice of praise to God by denying yourself and as a sacrifice of atonement. St. Anthony of Egypt after his terrible struggles, which he had to undergo. He, he was horribly tempted by the devil. I don't know if you know that. Awful. He was just trying to get away <laughs> from the devil. He decided to go out into the desert in order to get away from the worldly city life. He would go out into the desert. That's where he thought that he would have peace to think about God. The devil tempted him in horrible, horrible ways. There's actually drawings of it, you know, with all sorts of apparitions of animals and uh, terrible. So you should read about St. Anthony of Egypt in your spare time. All right, so uh, he said to our Lord, where were you, O good Jesus? 
during these temptations. And our Lord responded, I was present, but I wanted to see you fight. That's in the Vita Patrum. I think that's in the library. I wanted to see you fight. Because St. Anthony of Egypt was setting up monastic life. He was setting up essentially religious life. He was the father of religious life. So the devil had to get him. The, the, the angels are very, very bright and smart. They see future things very easily by just figuring them out. And they saw in him a tremendous amount of good that he will do for many, many centuries. So they had to get him. God sends sufferings in order to kill in man earthly desires, worldly thoughts, and to have thoughts and desires for heaven penetrate his soul. See, if, if given original sin and all of the effects of original sin in us, if we just had a, a paradise on earth, we would fall into much worse sins. If everything were comfort and delight and pleasure, So it's, it's a, a way of correcting us and disciplining us with regard to pursuing the things of God, the things of the, the Spirit. That's because of the effects of original sin. Before original sin, we were in control. And actually, before original sin, the way we merited salvation was by enjoying the things that God created for us. Those were meritorious acts. They were all under control. They would have been under control. But once sin intervened, suffering has to intervene as well. So it's a whole different, what we call, economy of salvation. All right, I'll just finish here. <clears throat> it is in this way that God prepares man to enter into the city of the elect. It's by these sufferings. According to the words of sacred scripture, per multas tribulationes oportet nos entrare in regnum Dei. That's St. Paul in Acts chapter 14, verse 21, that through many tribulations it is necessary for us to enter into the kingdom of God. There it is. And in St. Matthew, our Lord says, Renium celorum vim patitur et violentis rap violentes rapiunt illud. The, rain, the kingdom of heaven bears force and the violent take it. So that violence is the the violence that you show toward the devil, the flesh, the world, that kind of spiritual violence, that combat, that's how you gain eternal salvation. It's not that you're supposed to go out and shoot people. The, the, it's a violence with the, the powers of hell. <clears throat> 